Hi, everyone who is joining our webinar this evening. Um, we were just giving some individuals time to log in, but I want to be respectful of your time. So we will begin this evening's uh, webinar as part of our November campaign, which is the month-long educational initiative that aims to provide various um, information, and resources related to chronic pain. Our theme this year is Art Through Pain, and this evening's webinar is titled Art Therapy, Giving Chronic Pain a Voice Through Creative Expression. I'm going to introduce our presenter momentarily, but I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. The first is that you do have the option to submit questions either during or at the end of this presentation. Um, our guest speaker is going to be doing a Q&A session at the end. But if you have any technical difficulties, either with seeing the slides or, or hearing the presenter, please feel free to use your questions panel and to type that in so we can make sure that we fix it. Um, if you want to just let me know that the questions option is working by clicking on the question mark on your questions panel, just send me a quick test or hello, that would be great. Can everyone see the screen that says art therapy? Test, wonderful to be here. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Gwen. It's working. Okay, great. So everyone can see the screen. So now you know how to utilize your questions panel. Um, everyone is muted for this session, and we are going to begin. I will just start off by saying I'm going to be moderating this evening's webinar. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to type them out as we go along. Our presenter this evening is Christine Hirabayashi. She's a licensed marriage and family therapist, a board certified art therapist, and doctorate of philosophy in art therapy. Now, since 2004, Christine has specialized in chronic pain management. She does work for an interdisciplinary functional restoration program at IPM Medical Group in Los Gatos, California. With her passion for helping others express emotion through art, Christine offers individual and group art therapy, support groups, workshops, and she also facilitates an off-site open art studio that's designed to foster a supportive community and creative outlet for those living with chronic pain. Her vision is to continue finding innovative ways to strengthen and heal the mind and body through the use of art therapy. And we are so extremely pleased and honored to have her with us this evening to kick off this month's November campaign. Christine, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Shanna, thanks for having me today. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, can you advance to the next slide? Perfect. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, I guess I'm already ready for the next slide so we can give you an overview. So in today's webinar, um, I, I will discuss pain, the emotional impact it has on a person when it becomes chronic, and review how art therapy has been integrated as part of an interdisciplinary outpatient functional restoration program. I'll share examples of art that includes masks, sculptures of pain, and bridge drawings. And we'll also give resources to learn more about art therapy and how to find an art therapist, share ideas of how to make art at home for expression, and use it as a tool to focus attention away from pain. So I'm, I'm hoping that the images shared today will not only be relatable to those living with pain, but inspire the use of creativity for those who are searching for an expression for pain. Next slide. So first, a quick definition of pain. Many people can define pain in different ways, depending on how they conceptualize it. Pain can be described as a physical sensation or an emotional response to a particular situation. In a medical setting, the International Association for Study of Pain has defined it as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. This definition acknowledges both the physiological and also the psychological components of experiencing pain. Next slide. So 
Those of you experiencing chronic pain, you already know that pain has a significant and detrimental impact on an individual's psychological and social well being. The experience of chronic pain can change your identity, occupation, healthy relationships, mental health, and general quality of life. When pain doesn't go away, many are unprepared for the, for the psychological impact that pain has brought into their lives. And depending on the severity, there is often financial stress due to inability to work, and for some has led to loss of self-identity and also purpose. Most have isolated themselves due to pain, which has impacted communication and also close relationships in their lives. And common emotional reactions to living with chronic pain include depression, anger, irritability, anxiety, lowered self-esteem, and decreased memory. Next slide. Art therapy is a complementary treatment that integrates psychotherapy and art making. It is considered a mental health profession where clients facilitated by a trained art therapist used art media and the creative process to explore and talk about their feelings. Art therapy is an indirect way to dis discuss difficult feelings, and it provides a therapeutic space where a person can externalize feelings often too threatening to discuss. It also can release often unconscious repressed emotions and conflicts. Art therapy allows for meaning to emerge through the metaphor and opens up an opportunity for insight and understanding to be discovered. Next slide, please. Treatment for complications that result from chronic pain has been, most, has been proven most effective when using a combination of modalities that integrate treatment for the mind and body. The interdisciplinary program that I work in integrates components of medication optimization, physical therapy, psychology, nutrition, and other complementary treatments that include uh, relaxation techniques such as medication, I'm sorry, meditation, tai chi, yoga, and other mindfulness practices. And also art therapy is included as part of interdisciplinary care. It has been found that qualities in art therapy are not always available through traditional medical interventions, and research has shown that it could be considered as a part of, a valuable part of treatment to interdisciplinary care. Next slide. The Functional Restoration Program at IPM mainly treats individuals that have been work injured and have the diagnosis of pain. Most participants have been injured for somewhere between one to 10 years, and in some cases, even longer. They experience back, neck, knee, or shoulder pain, and some have been diagnosed with chronic uh, regional pain syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, or experience migraine headaches. And those are just some experience of pain, just to list a few. But by the time the patients come to our clinic, um, many have gone through several invasive surgeries, which have caused additional complications, resulting in increased pain. They've tried procedures such as epidural steroid injections, or may have implanted device such as spinal cord stimulators, that were unsuccessful with helping with pain. And many use medication and as a result develop, have, have developed a pretty high tolerance to opiates. And for some, it's been really the only way that they've learned to manage their pain. So the program that we offer at IPM is an eight week outpatient program. It offers a variety of non-pharmacological approaches to managing chronic pain. And as part of treatment, art therapy is offered four days a week for one hour a day, along with other the other treatments mentioned earlier. These groups are conducted in small groups of six participants or less. And while in art therapy, participants are asked to create imagery and talk about their experience of pain. Through this process, they learn to, expre to express themselves in a creative way that deepens reflection and self-understanding. Next slide. So in the next few slides, I'm going to share some examples of masks that were made in the functional restoration program. Because chronic pain is invisible, it is something that could be easily masked. Many people do not want to burden their friends or family with the pain and feelings they experience as a result. 
So they put their best face forward, they put on their makeup, they smile through their pain, rather than outwardly showing their discomfort. And so for this mask project, I asked patients to consider what mask they wear for others. On the outside, I ask, how do others see you? And on the inside, I have them consider, how do you see yourself? In the next few slides, I'm gonna share a few examples of masks. And this first example was made by a school teacher. She, de she describes on the outside of the mask, she wears, um, this is the mask that she wears for her students, family, and friends. She describes the only way people can tell that she's in pain is in her eyes. And sometimes they look tired and maybe irritable. Um, and her mouth is not really a smile or a frown. Next slide, please. And on the inside, she describes feeling like she is constantly looking through a band of darkness. Um, this is what she describes as her depression with her tears on the inside with the temporary band-aids that say, don't cry, don't complain, push yourself, don't scream, and just survive. In her mind, the words pain, hopeless, anger, and stress. And because she was in week one of the program, she was just starting to experience some feelings of hope, forgiveness, and relaxation. Next slide, please. So if you look at both sides, uh, masks side by side, you can kind of see, you could really see the contrast of how much emotion she was really hiding behind her mask. Next slide. In this next mask, this man describes that people saw him as a strong person. The outside was meant to look like metal with rivets. He put mirrors in his eyes because he said that he was a person who holds himself to other people's expectations, um, like being a good father, a good husband, or a, a dependable employee. And if you look closely at the mouth, he glued a little squeaker toy that made a noise if you squeezed it from the inside. And he did this because he said he was usually an outspoken person, but through pain and injury, he felt as if his voice had been reduced down just to a squeak. So being in the workers' comp system, he felt like he wasn't being heard. The doctors didn't understand what he was saying and his family wasn't listening to what he had to say. On the inside, uh, a few things have fallen out. There, were, there was an empty medication bottle, a heavy rock. Everything that he put on the inside of the mask meant something. So you see the ruler for not measuring up, the money for financial issues, the balloon uh, describes his deflated thoughts um, when he couldn't remember what he had to say because he said that he was in too much pain and sometimes losing his thoughts because he was on medication. Next slide, please. The next mask uh, was made by somebody in week one in the program. Initially, he was a really quiet person in the group but was able to share more about himself when he talked about his mask. And on the left side of the mask, he described um, the more dark, cynical side of himself that developed, um, and more of the off-putting part of himself that he used purposefully to push people away. And on the other side, uh, camouflage, because he said he would rather blend in with his surroundings and not have people ask him about his pain. The lock is over his mouth because he says he never likes or wants to talk about his pain. And the bolts because he said he never takes off his mask. On the inside, you could see it's pretty empty. The bolts, they turn into pain with the words escape, more pills, more pain relief, and a question mark for his future. He uh, also added a bullet shell that represented uh, the suicidal thoughts that he had um, on desperate pain days. And while explaining this mask, he said he was actually able to talk about the guilt um, that he felt as a result of worrying his friends and family. Next slide, please. This next mask is the same person eight weeks later. 
So he describes that finally he ended up taking off his mask. Um, in the program, he was working hard. The band-aids represented the healing he was doing. Although one eye still closed, the other one is open, uh, looking forward to the future. He said he was fighting, uh, sweating, working hard, and literally he cut a hole open to open his mind. And if you look closely behind um, that area, there's supposed to be his thoughts, which he said, um, now his wheels are turning. And on the outside rim of the mask, um, in yellow, it represented hope. On the inside, um, more hope with the tools that he learned in the program, with the finger pointing to the future with the words love, wish, and dream. Next slide. So if you were to compare uh, week one and eight, uh, they, it looks like a completely different person created these two masks. And comparing artwork made at different times really helps a person to see progress of how, how far they've come. And in some cases, they might feel completely different about the art they made depending on the pain level that day or how they were feeling. Next slide, please. These two drawings illustrate the metamorphosis of breaking out of the mask of pain. And um, she describes um, starting to see things from a new perspective. And Carla describes, art has been a release of my anger due to my loss of physical and emotional ability to process my limitations. When I look at my drawings, I realize that I cannot go back to what I was before the pain, but it reminds me that I can move forward and be a better me. Next slide, please. These examples of masks show that sometimes pain goes beyond words and feelings can better be understood through imagery. Often, unresolved psychological pain around trauma plays a large role with not allowing a person to grieve, manage, and move forward to gaining acceptance and integrating pain as part of their life. Art therapy allows a person to pay homage to their pain and helps them to embrace the struggles in life that they have encountered and honor suffering. Next slide. Another directive that I introduce in the FRP is sculpting pain out of clay. So for this directive, I have them imagine, if you are able to take your pain out of your body and sculpt it into a tangible object, what would it look like? Once the pain is sculpted, I have them write down how pain would describe itself using I, I statements. Um, so I am pain, I come and go as I please. And once the pain describes itself, the next step is I ask them to have a conversation with their pain. The reason why I like this directive is that for many people that have become their, many people they've, they've actually become their pain and it has become their primary identity. Um, they have been experiencing pain for so long they can't imagine conceptualizing pain outside of themselves. And this directive allows space for a dialogue for a person to be angry at, accepting to, or be friendly with their pain. And it empowers the person to find a voice and through the metaphor, take action in a way that gives the person the opportunity to confront it. Next slide, please. This person sculpted pain as a green monster face. And pain says, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do regardless of what you do and what you would like to happen. I'm going to twist you, burn you, irritate you, and make you feel tired to the point of going crazy not knowing what to do. And the conversation back says, I want you to pick up and go away, but if you're not, then let's sit down and figure out how to live with each other because I'm not going anywhere and I obviously can't go anywhere. We're going to have to find a way to just get along and you don't have to be so angry all the time and I don't have to get so frustrated. So can't we just all get along? Next slide, please. In this example, Payne says, Tick tock, I am pain. I crawl through your muscles and veins like lava flowing down a volcano. I erupt and sometimes rumble with intense fire. 
I awaken on command and fill you with pain and destruction. And the conversation back says, Dear pain, I don't hate you, but I do not like the way that you have controlled me. I want to tell you that it's time for me to take back myself as a person. I love myself and my family so much that I no longer want to see them suffer due to the pain and anxiety that I have. Every day I pray for my health and I will be healthier. I will be in a healthier place in the future. Next slide. After I have them make I statements and a conversation, I invite them to transform their pain in any way they feel they need to. Some people keep their pain the same because they know it's something that they are gonna have to learn to accept. And sometimes they draw or sculpt what the pain needs. And in this last example, the pain says, I burn, I jab, I like to shoot sharp searing pain down your neck, back and legs. I will always show up when you least expect it. I am in charge. I come and go when I want, not when you want. And the conversation this person had simply says, you won't be in charge for long. I'm learning how to deal with you and control you. I will be the winner. I will conquer. Next slide, please. Art creates a safe outlet for emotions. In group therapy, patients share the commonality of having pain. And there's an unsaid understanding and feelings are understood and validated. Art becomes a container for expression and creates a safe place for thoughts or ideas to evolve. It provides a space to try out a new way of thinking and allows someone to be more vulnerable with their feelings, providing an indirect way to talk about their emotions, to transform feelings about hope and gain perspective about their experience of pain. Next slide, please. The last art directive that I'm gonna to share today is a bridge drawing. And on one side, I asked to create what life was like before starting the functional restoration. And on the other side, I have them consider what life would be like in the future. Then I asked them to build a bridge connecting these two places in time. And last, I asked to put yourself on the bridge where you are today. And what this directive does is it helps to facilitate a, a discussion about where they were, where they feel like they are today, and also gives the opportunity to reflect on where they're heading in the future. Next slide, please. Following the completion of the FRP, we have a free aftercare program for graduates. And in aftercare, participants are encouraged to continue creating art on an offsite open studio. This environment provides a social outlet, safe, non judgmental space for participants to discover and to redefine themselves as artists and not patients. Artists in the studio often choose to dive deeper into their creative process after the FRP. And this allows them to explore pain from other aspects of their life, giving a voice to previous stories that for some have never been shared. Next slide, please. The following short clip features artists from the open studio. In this video, they'll discuss how art has been beneficial um, with their expression for pain. I just want to make sure that we don't start before. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Is there sound? Can everyone hear the sound? I, just I, don't, hear some, I don't hear sound on my end. Oh, that's interesting. OK. Um, Hmm. Do you hear sound on your end? Yes, I do. I hear oh, sound. Okay, I'll be quiet. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, I'm, uh, I can see the image. I can see the images moving. So everyone's saying no sound. So I'm going to I'm going to play it again and let's see if 
I want to see if it starts over maybe. Can you guys let me know if you can hear it now? Okay, so I don't know why, um, but this slide is playing, but, uh, and I can hear the audio, but it's not coming through. Um, the only other thing I'm going to try is maybe not using earbuds. So um, I'm going to play it again. Can everyone hear? Yes or no? I think you just need to turn up the volume. I could hear it kind of. Hmm. Okay, so it is not coming through as clearly as I would have hoped. Um, I think some people said that it was coming through faintly. So um, what I'm going to do, um, Christine, is, um, and, and for those of you who are watching, I apologize. I'm, I'm not sure what is happening with the program this evening. Um, it is very muffled or um, breaking up or garbled, some people are saying. So what we can do is... Um, Christine, if you're comfortable with sharing the link to this video, and then we can just email this link to participants later. That'd be great. Okay, I apologize. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, let's see if we can go to the right. next. This is the resources page, correct? Sure, so let me just explain a little bit. It was just a short clip, it was about three minutes, and it had about five different participants um, that went through the FRP program, they uh, create art in the open studio. And in their own words, they were able to share how art therapy helped them with um, expressing themselves through pain. So hopefully you all can go back to that link and, um, and watch it. It's just a short clip, it's about three minutes. Okay, so we're on the right slide. So, um, so some art therapy resources. Um, if you are interested in learning more about art therapy, please visit the American Art Therapy Association. Um, this is a website uh, that explains more about the field of art therapy. It shares informative videos about the profession and how to find an art therapist in your area. And it even lists accredited universities that you can attend to become a certified art therapist amongst other helpful resources. Next slide, please. So, so now some of you might be thinking, I, I'm not a creative person and I don't think art therapy is for me. And I agree, art therapy might not be for everybody, but keep in mind that art in art therapy, an art therapist is trained to kind of guide you in a, in a comfortable way to express yourself. And there is no wrong way to create the art. The images, they don't always have to be positive or look pretty. Um, even stick figures are okay. And keep in mind that sometimes it's more about the process than what the actual finished product ends up looking like. Um, when participants first start in the FRP, I would say many or most categorize themselves as non-artists who haven't had a lot of experience with drawing. Um, they are not familiar with what art therapy is or understand why it's included as a part of treatment. And they look at me sort of crazy and they say, how is art going to help me with my pain? And so when I give an art directive and I ask them to draw, most are usually pretty skeptical, um, but I encourage them to try to keep an open mind to the process. And surprisingly, most people do. Um, as they get comfortable with the art making process, they find that the art oftentimes starts to kind of speak for itself. And even for the, for the non-artist, it becomes easier for them to share feelings more openly. Next slide. If, um, if you don't make art and therapy, there are still ways to use creativity as an expression for pain or a mindfulness practice that helps to focus attention away from pain. I encourage you to be open to trying to explore new creative rituals, no matter how simple or strange it might start to feel at first. 
but just to remember that creativity, it exists within all of us in different ways. And so searching to find creative projects that immerse yourself into the kind of that flow of creativity is something that will be really helpful for you. Um, you might consider taking up a new hobby of drawing, painting, photography, or even any, any, any creative process, um, even flower arranging. Uh, the, the key is to find something inspirational, um, something that inspires and interests you. Next slide, please. Some of you already know um, adult coloring books have been recently become quite a phenomenon. In 2015, Amazon rated these books as one of its top 20 bestsellers. And although coloring isn't considered a form of art therapy described by the profession, I believe it does hold some therapeutic value, especially for those experiencing pain. And research shows that engaging in a process uh, such as coloring can actually produce positive physical changes in the body. Um, EEG brain scans have shown an increase in alpha wave patterns when participating in a creative activity. And these brain waves are associated with feelings of restful alertness, which is also similar to a state of meditation. So for those of you who have busy minds, coloring can be a way to slow down thoughts and also stop the loop of thinking about pain. And the great thing about these books is that you can color anywhere at any time with anyone. It's not necessarily an activity that you have to do with children or your grandchildren. It's actually something that you can do with your friends, family, and even older adults. And many, um, many of the clients that I work with find it beneficial to color. So say if you travel um, on airplanes or share it as a quiet activity with their children when their bodies can't be as active as normal because of pain. And often they find sitting down together in a relaxed state, sometimes it helps to open up conversations they really wouldn't have had otherwise if they weren't spending that time together. And at our, at our clinic, we introduce uh, coloring pre-drawn mandalas as a relaxation technique. It's also used as an active meditation and many participants are surprised to find that sometimes they actually experience less pain after an hour of this activity. And, and by all means, I'm not saying that this is going to be a, a cure-all technique. However, depending on your pain level that day, it could be something needed to help keep your mind and body calm. Next slide, please. In addition to coloring, uh, you can consider making visual journals. A visual journal can be created in many ways. There are several different published books and online blogs that have described this process, and it doesn't take much to get started. All you really need is a, a simple sketchbook. Gather up your art supplies, and you can be creative what you already have or purchase new art materials. And I would say your basic supplies that to get started would include at least just a simple variety of pens and pencils, and I would also recommend a, a small pair of scissors and a glue stick. And this should be just enough to get started so that you can easily pack it in a really uh, small bag so you can carry it with it with you so you're prepared when whenever that creativity strikes. And later you can probably work on expanding your art supplies depending on what you prefer working with. And Remember that your visual journal, it's a, it's a private space to draw your thoughts and feelings. There is no wrong way to make a creative journal entry because it is personal to you. It is a small creative space that can be a container for your emotions, whether dark, playful, sad, hopeful, or angry. It is an intentional place to write down your inner thoughts, goals, wishes, or dreams. You can add words, quotes or poetry, sketch what you see around you or draw images that inspire you. And um, I would also have you consider using magazines or photographs to add to your journal. 
You can even um, glue things, uh, everyday things that you see around you, like leaves or labels or anything basically that catches your eye. Um, another creative way is to journal is to make an altered book. And an altered book is a mixed media artwork that changes a book from its original form to a different form. And it alters its appearance and meaning. Um, you can make collages using pages from a book, or you can draw and paint actually uh, right into the book. And I recommend searching visual journal or altered book for additional ideas to get started. Next slide. Um, for those of you who are tech savvy individuals, the internet, um, of course, makes it very easy to connect to creative resources. You can consider downloading creative based apps, create mess free art with sketching apps for tablets or iPads. Um, there are also easily downloadable apps for even coloring mandalas. So you, what you do is you just touch the screen to fill in areas to add color. There are also very user friendly apps for photo editing or maybe for making collage. And if you are homebound by paying YouTube, I love YouTube. They can provide a plethora of creative step-by-step -step drawing or painting to tutorials for those who might be looking for a creative distraction. So if you think about it, kind of the, the ideas are, are limitless. And by doing a search, you might find something that interests you. And it is cathartic to make art to express yourself. And if willing, sharing your art with others can be therapeutic too. Next slide, please. So whether you're a non-artist considering how to explore your creativity or an artist that already makes art, uh, during the month of November, the U.S. Pain Foundation is launching this month's campaign, which is Art Through Pain. And the U.S. Pain Foundation is interested in seeing the art that you create. And so for more information on this, on how to participate, uh, please visit their website. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, art is a universal language. It can express a feeling felt by others without having to say a word. Like the experience of pain, some things cannot be expressed through grammatical structures, such as those found in language. They require some other symbolism if we are to understand them. I love this quote. It's from Suzanne Langer, who is an American philosopher, writer, and educator known for her theories on the influences that art has on the mind. So in conclusion, I hope um, this presentation has helped to explain how art can be therapeutic and its process and also inspire some people to explore creativity as a way to heal and also to give a voice to pain. And last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm going to um, just give everyone a few seconds if they want to gather their thoughts and um, submit questions. We did have some coming in during your presentation. Um, so let's get right to it here. Um, well, first off, um, we did have a few that just wanted to compliment you. Um, and say that they, but one person, Cheryl says she loves the open studio and that you're very supportive and awesome. Oh, <laughs> Cheryl. <laughs> and then uh, Juana says that uh, they love art therapy. They are a support group facilitator and they actually incorporate art therapy um, into their program. Oh, that is awesome to hear. Yes. Um, so one question that we had come in, and I think this is a fantastic one, is wondering who pays for a functional restoration program? So um, I, maybe I might not have made that clear in the description. So the, um, the clinic um, IPM, Integrated Pain Management, they uh, see uh, patients that have chronic pain. The functional restoration program is mainly for work injured patients. So they have a workers' comp claim 
And it's actually an interdisciplinary program that is authorized through Workers' Comp. So this is Workers' Comp California. Okay. All yeah. right. Are there similar programs across the country that may or may not just work on a workers' comp basis? They do. If you do look there, I would say that there are other interdisciplinary programs. Um, however, they kind of vary. Um, I know there are several in just even within Northern California. Um, some do or may not include art therapy. Um, so you're going to have to sort of do a do a search for that. Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. uh, oh. of, no, I was just going to say it was um, Michelle, um, a different Michelle, <laughs> um, wrote that she's a spiritual coach and is really creative with um, with advocacy for fibromyalgia and. She advocates um, unraveling fibrotoxins through creative art expression. And she would like to get more formal training um, on either art therapy or something that she's doing. But um, at her, she's just concerned that at her age and having a chronic pain condition, um, mm -hmm. getting a PhD seems a little overwhelming at this time. So her <laughs> question is, is there a lesser route to go, whether it's less than a certified art therapist, but kind of along the same lines? Are there alternative options? Well, first of all, you don't have to have a PhD to be an art therapist. Um, it's, it's, I was actually, I went through a master's de degree program, uh, Notre Dame de Noir in Belmont, California. And it's kind of a dual uh, program where you get your uh, master's degree in marriage and family therapy and art degree. Um, if you have a psychology background or um, uh, an art background, uh, you can get a master's degree. Um, if you already have, I believe, a psychological, like say if you're a counselor, um, they do have some certificate programs. Um, I would actually, um, the best, your best bet might be to visit the website. Um, American Art Therapy Association, and they tell you the different types of um, programs that you can go through. Um, and you know, I say with chronic pain, it's 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 tough to get started in a new career. Um, but for what I found is, for many people, it's provided them the opportunity to have the time to reflect and see, like, okay, well, maybe I do want to go back to school. It's it's it, maybe it'll provide the time. Um, so good luck with that. If you have any questions um, specifically, um, you could feel free to contact me about um, your ideas for that as well too. But I, I strongly advocate for anybody who um, is interested in art therapy or interested in becoming or getting an education to become an art therapist. Great, thanks and great response. Um, David said too that um, this stuff works. Our brain can process only so much information at one time and He's a writer, an abstract artist, and a bass player. And he says that when he engages in any of those activities, he's pain-free. Um, do some of your patients experience that as well? Do they do they actually say at one point, or you know, at some point throughout either you know the eight-week program or during the open studio that they do have moments where they're pain-free? Yes, all the time. And you know, it's funny because in the FRP, I'm getting a, a wide variety of people. We're talking about 65-year-old mechanics that have never drawn with a, uh, a crayon. And I have to see them every day um, or, well, for four, four days out of the week. And, you know, they're in there and they're coloring or they're, they're talking. And they, it, my favorite part is when they admit that they're actually relaxing. And then the best part is when they start to realize that their pain actually changes. Just, just physically while they're coloring or they're working on their project. And, and it doesn't really have to be art therapy. You said it's music as well too. I think it's just getting into the flow of using your creativity can just do some really amazing things on in the moment uh, with the pain that you're experiencing. Excellent. Um, Gwen um, says that she's received a lot of great ideas from you to do with her clients as well as her support group. So thank you so much for uh, the information that you provided in this presentation. Somebody wanted to know, Susan um, is asking, is there such a thing as an art therapy assistant? 
an art therapy assistant? Um, I would say um, in my practice where I'm at, we do have art therapy interns um, that actually are uh, learning and training to be art therapists. But where I'm at now, as far as assistants, I could see uh, maybe if you were, if it was more of like an open studio situation where um, I just wanted to make the clarification of the open studio versus art therapy. Art therapy is more focused on um, uh, art directives. We talk specifically about uh, feelings. I ask them questions to process their feelings a little bit more. And um, open studio is an environment where it's meant to be more of a community of people with chronic pain. They paint whatever they want that day and I'm more of an art facilitator or an art teacher. And I could see in that kind of environment where there can be an opportunity for somebody to um, help out or be an assistant um, to be able to kind of help people be creative and to kind of help facilitate in just that actual painting process. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, mm -hmm. It actually is a great segue into another question, a follow-up question to the functional restoration program itself. Do you provide art therapy for people outside of FRP? And if so, who pays for that? Um, at the clinic at IPM, I, uh, I do individual groups. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I do groups, art therapy groups. I also do talk therapy groups. Um, the thing about art therapy is in the way that it's coded and for like uh, insurance purposes. Um, I am also a marriage and family therapist. And so um, at our clinic, we're able to kind of, we're, we're billing for therapy. Um, as far as having it art therapy being covered, um, your best bet is to be able to find an art therapist similar to myself who also has a license and something like marriage and family therapy background in psychology where you can see an individual therapist or if, if that's what they're looking for. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Um, well, uh, this is um, not a question that they had asked, but um, one that I'm going to pose is, um, are there um, practicing art therapists throughout the country who um, see somebody similarly to a um, marriage and family therapist where they have one-on-one -on -one sessions that are covered by insurance? Yes, absolutely. So um, there are plenty of art therapists that have private practices. Um, I myself have a private practice. If you go online, again, I keep mentioning the American Art Therapy Association. They have a therapist finder. Um, I know um, what's also a helpful resource is Psychology Today. And um, you can maybe type in um, psychologytoday.com. If you type in art therapist, um, some may pop up in your area. It's a great therapist finder for um, you put in your zip code and it pops up um, profiles of therapists in your area. And um, an art therapist might be a specialist that you might be able to find within the area where you live. Excellent. I'm going to pause for a moment, Christine, um, because I did want to give everyone the opportunity to visually see you as well as Michelle, who oh, I great. understand has been through, yeah, the program as well as um, participated in the open studio concept. So uh, going to, yay, hi guys. <laughs> We're starting the party session of the webinar. <laughs> um, so uh, I just wanted to introduce, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Christine is the one with the darker hair and Michelle is with her, um, with the blonde hair, gorgeous locks. Um, and Michelle, I understand that you actually have participated in this program? Yes, I went through the FRP program with Christine back in 2005. And then after I graduated from the eight week program, they were offering art therapy support groups um, once a week that I went for years, all the way up until um, about two years ago, I continued going. Okay, excellent. And were some of those directives that Christine was providing in the presentation um, similar or the exact type of uh, modules that you participated in? Yes, all of them but one. Um, we did not have the sculpting one um, at the time that I went through, but all the others I recognized. And I also participate in the open art studio. 
Can you talk a little bit during the eight week program um, for those who may be considering doing something similar? Um, what was a challenge for you during the process, um, whether it you know was just the fact that you were you know um, dealing with chronic pain while trying to engage in something or um, if you thought you weren't artistic, like what what were some of the challenges for you? So actually both of those. Um, one of the <laughs> biggest challenges was that um, I am a perfectionist and so I was not understanding the concept of art therapy that it was not about, as Christine mentioned in her presentation, it was not about the finished product and how pretty it looked um, or how ugly it was gonna look <laughs> if you're trying to depict your pain. Um, it was about the process and getting your emotions out. And I remember um, in the eight week program, something that came out um, through my art, uh, I don't know if you remember this, Christine, but the doctors and everybody that works with um, the people in the FRP program, they would meet and discuss the patients in the program once a week. And so Christine shared some of my art and what she had discovered, which I didn't have any clue of at the time, was one of the things that came out through the art was my fear of failure. And if that hadn't come out in the art, we would never have addressed that. And so I remember that clearly that came out mm. early on um, in the program. Um, so getting over my uh, need to be a perfectionist was definitely a challenge. Um, by the end of the eight weeks though, I was like, I got it, I was ready to go. I'd sometimes be starting on my project before she was even finished giving the directive. So it really was one of the best parts of the program for me. And that's why I continued going to the support groups for so many years after. Um, dealing with the emotional aspect of chronic pain to me was much more challenging than the physical part. Not to take away the, from the physical, but I kind of adapted more to that um, easier than I did to the grieving process um, that comes along with living with chronic pain. So art therapy was what really helped me um, get over the hurdle. And it took a long time, but it's also a fun way of doing it. And as you said earlier, somebody commented um, uh, about playing music and, and painting and drawing and everything. It does help take your mind away from the pain for a little while. So it helps not just in a therapeutic way with your mind, but it also helps you to cope with the physical part. And just in your experience, Christine, with seeing clients I, um, outside of art in of itself, um, is distraction in of itself one tool that can be utilized in pain management, whether it's art or music, as was mentioned, or, or something completely different, just being outside? Right. I mean, when you think about art and, and just generally creativity, even if you're not an artist, there are many different ways that you can immerse yourself in creativity, whether it even be if it's baking, I mean, it doesn't have to be literally making art but that that's the beauty of of just discovering something that um, allows you to immerse yourself into something and, and getting into that flow when you are having chronic pain and how it kind of distracts you as well excellent i, w I was curious about that because some people um We've been posting on social media since the start of our November campaign. We've been getting a lot of different comments and either um, people who may not think that art um, is is for them because they're not creative or that they feel that their pain is actually so limiting um, their ability. So um, I guess my question for those individuals is, you know, if they're if they're telling us as an organization or telling you as a therapist that they can't physically pick up a pencil to do um, drawing or that they can't use their hands at all, um, then what advice or tips do you have for those people? Well, when you make art, um, there's many different ways. Um, we, I work with a lot of people that have upper extremity pain um, and we just kind of work with um, what feels most comfortable. And there's a lot of, of, of different ways to try to, well, first of all, you have to let go of the inner critic. Um, and mm -hmm. be open. I think maybe one of the most important pieces, especially for people that start the functional restoration program, they have no choice to participate in heart therapy. You know, they walk into the room, they see the crayons, and they're like, oh my God, why am I here? <laughs> 
Um, but for those of you who are like, eh, I don't really know, I mean, does art really work? I think if you keep an open mind um, and give yourself the opportunity to explore something different um, and everyone's different. So you have to find something that really interests you. So if you don't think you're an artist, you know, just starting some sketching, like I said, just maybe doing some YouTube videos, um, talking to other creative people, maybe getting involved in, um, in, in a workshop or, or something like that. It's, it's just, um, I wouldn't stop yourself from exploring creativity because you don't feel like you're an artist because most of the people that I do work with, they're there because they're in the program and they were not expecting to do art therapy. But at the end of eight weeks, um, I would say most, if not all, um, grow an appreciation for the idea like, wow, I never gave myself that opportunity to play. Um, I, or I haven't drawn since I was a kid. Um, they say that creativity is one of the last things that leaves you. And so in this opportunity of just trying to stay open, you know, maybe you might discover that a new talent. Um, a lot of the people in the open studio that I work with, um, they would never consider themselves artists, um, but they, they come back, they paint, and you'd be surprised to see what people discover about themselves. It's pretty amazing. We're also getting some tips in from attendees who are saying that individuals can um, consider, you know, if, if they can't uh, write with their hand, that use a dictation software, or like you had mentioned, um, that there are some drawing mandala apps that are out there too yes. Yes. for those days. Um, yes. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add that um, some of the people that come to the open studio who have the upper extremity, um, one person that's actually in the little video clip right. that you can go back to later, um, her name is Dee Dee and she has CRPS in her hands and she has trouble holding a paintbrush. So she does all of her art with her with her fingers, like finger painting, or she does what's that liquid acrylic um, where it looks marbleized. She does that. Um, I don't know what they call it, flow or the marble painting. Yeah, um, where she's not even using her hands really at all to do that. It, no fine motor skills are being are being used for that. And in fact, the very first painting that I ever did um, when I went to Open Studio, mine was kind of like an art therapy one. I was trying to get out a certain emotion. Um, but I did not use a paintbrush either. So uh, you do not need to be an artist and you do not need to be able to sketch or, or anything like that to get something out of doing art and being creative. Yeah, it's very emotional. It's very cathartic to be able just to get messy and, and to paint with your hands as well too. So there's a lot of different modalities of how to get the creativity out. Hmm. Um, you just have to be willing to explore them. And now these days there's all kinds of materials. And collage, there's, we do a lot, of, do collage a lot of collage work too. too. Well. Um, somebody, Christine did a, um, an open, or what do you call it, the art show, uh, an art show with people um, who had created art from the FRP programs and open studio. And mm -hmm. one of the, uh, one or two of the pieces that were up there were created um, all out of collage. Uh, he it was, a, it was a man and he didn't paint on it and his art was still so expressive and, and was really helpful to him. And that's without drawing any picture. Yeah. So just flipping through magazines, finding images that speak to you, um, that, that in itself is, is a form of art as well, too. It could be very expressive. I am. Um, one of taking... the directors, actually, in the art therapy program, uh, or the FRP program, Art Therapy Hour, was uh, just going through um, the clippings and not having a planned idea of what you're going to pick, just whatever calls to you at that moment. And mm -hmm. that was always surprising to people in the group also, what kind of pictures or words would draw them in. So I was taking um, some notes during your presentation, Christine, and some of the slides were um, really captivating and unique and um, emotional for a person living with chronic pain. And um, I really had I had a deep appreciation for the different modules that you have selected in the eight week program. Um, the mask I think is super innovative and I think um, definitely tugged at a few of my heartstrings. I'm not sure how other attendees felt because I think that there was something from almost all of those masks that um, we have experienced during one time or another along our pain journey. And um, I think it's interesting that art can also connect us uh, not only to ourselves, but to others um, through that. So thank you for sharing that the mask one. Um, 
during the sculpting uh, module that you did, um, it seemed like you wanted the individual to talk to their pain mm -hmm. or, or, or for pain to talk to them and then they respond. Um, should someone with chronic pain who's never done that before or even considered that, should they, I guess, should they talk to their pain? And um, like, why is it good? And if so, um, should they be doing it under the direction of a trained therapist or is it okay for them well, to talk to their pain alone? I'm sure people in chronic pain, they talk to their pain all the time. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but but when it comes yes. to, okay, so <laughs> I understand your question. So in, in art therapy and as an art therapist, you can get very emotional. And for some, it could be a very cathartic release. And so I would recommend that if you really feel like you need to get it out in a safe way, it's, of course, work with an art therapist or even a therapist to talk out your feelings. They have other forms of therapy to just to be able to get that conversation out. But, you know, if you feel like, you know, it's I'm not saying don't talk to your pain, but I mean, it's I think it's definitely something to think about. Um, because, um, like I said, many, for many, it's just become their identi identity, like they never thought to visualize pain outside of themselves. And so it gives you really just that opportunity to be like, okay, what would I say to my pain? Or what would my pain say? What voice would it say? And like, what do I really want to say to it? So as long as it's on a healthy enough level, you know, sure. I'm, I talk to myself all the time, right? <laughs> but I mean, if you, if if it's really that deep inner work that you want to do, I would highly recommend working with a trained art therapist. But you know, using art as a tool to um, distract yourself from pain, um, it, you know, some of the, the art directives in, that I do in the FRP for sure, um, those would be really great to be working with. Uh, that was meant to be directives for art therapists to work with you. Okay. Um, because even beyond what I described, there was the whole processing part where we actually, I asked them more questions like, what would the person on the bridge say? Or what does the person on the bridge need? Um, that's what would an art therapist would kind of develop more of that conversation and processing part of therapy where it can take it a little bit deeper. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And um, just back to the masks with the, um, the first week versus the eight week slide that you had on there with the gentleman who you said was shy at first and then, yes. but he opened up through that project. It had me wondering if individuals al along um, the way that you've met either in this program or outside of this program have actually utilized their pieces of art to explain their disease or chronic pain either with clinicians, friends, family members, caregivers. Well, here at the clinic, we do it all the time. But I think that and like art speaks volumes. And I think in ways that, um, I mean, I've seen some pretty intense artwork. And I think that for some, it could be that communication tool that helps them to really understand or help their family understand. Uh, oftentimes in art therapy, um, I well, I give all the artwork back to the person. Um, but I encourage them to take it home and use it as a springboard for discussion and you know talk about what you're learning in the program and and talk about how you feel or what you're sharing with other people so art can definitely be a way to uh, communicate to other people and Ms. Ms. Yeah, when, absolutely. when she um, put together the art show um, that's not just people living with chronic pain it's family friends um, acquaintances a lot of times sometimes mm -hmm. just strangers you know that come in and and see so it, it is a a way to start the conversation did you use any of the art michelle um along the way have you used any of your art to explain where you are emotionally or physically to others yes here <laughs> this Yay. one i was talking about the very first time i was in uh, went to open studio i was super angry and one of the issues that i was dealing with was i could not express my anger i was like the good girl i couldn't let myself get angry and christine had worked with me you know for at least eight weeks at that point probably longer because uh open studio didn't start until a while after i had graduated from the program but that one was done with um close my eyes and tell her the colors I wanted her to squirt on the canvas. And I did not use paintbrush. And because I was angry, I was literally scratching with my eyes shut, scratching at the canvas. And then um, I told Christina, I still feel, I feel like I want to stab the canvas. And so she handed me a palette knife for, you know, for painting, but I used it and the, there's actually holes ripped in the canvas. 
-hmm. And actually what I think we did on this piece that I showed um, before I even painted on it was I wrote words in a pencil with pencil, um, things that I was angry about and then painted over it. And yeah, it's one of the ugliest things I've ever created, but I hung on to it because it helped me to get out so much rage that I was feeling. And, um, but I've also now, you know, that I'm in a much better place mentally um, most of the time. Um, my art I've noticed is, is happier. Um, it's not so dark, um, but sometimes I go back to that dark place and art is a way to either get, get it out on the canvas or um, to distract. So, so that would be the example of wanting to work with a therapist, with a therapist especially if, sure. if you're, mm -hmm. if the anger is emerging and, and that's what an art therapist will help do is just to kind of, in, in a safe way, help to contain some of those feelings mm -hmm. to come out in a cathartic way. Right. So I didn't yeah. leave the studio all revved up and, you know, it was by the time mm -hmm. I left, I was calm and normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Chris didn't help me to deal with that. <laughs> but she didn't just send me on my way. <laughs> Yeah, we are. Um, I mean, we've definitely seen a lot of submissions already um, as part of the Art Through Pain initiative oh, um, through the November campaign and um, have had a lot of individuals respond that they have utilized different forms of art in order to cope with their pain levels and or their uh, chronic diseases. And it spanned from, you know, writing, photography, cooking, sewing, knitting. Um, some say that, you know, they used to be able to do this, but now they've done something else or or when they're feeling well enough they they do this they turn they turn to different um, forms of art so it definitely seems like um, a tool that a lot of chronic pain patients are starting to utilize or have been utilizing and and may have not um, maybe recognized that it's definitely part of their treatment plan um, I wanted to ask you before we close because we've used art therapy that expression so much this evening because obviously the art therapy is its own um, category and then there's creative expression, correct? So um, could you just differentiate the two if you wouldn't mind? Well, I think there's there's art and therapy, which is art therapy, working with an art therapist and also the understanding that art is therapeutic. Right. Um, before I was an art therapist, um, art was my therapy. And so there is a delineation between the two. Um, and so I think there is definitely benefits to, to explore both, um, depending on what your needs are, um, specifically if you have chronic pain. Um, I highly recommend just exploring your creativity as a way to find an outlet. And it doesn't necessarily have to go that deep or you have to go way back when, where you were born. But I think that you need to find like, okay, well, maybe I can find something that's useful for me in the way that, in the needs that you have um, with chronic pain. So there's there's just plenty, plenty of um, different ways, but there there is there is a delineation, delineation between both. Excellent. Um, so be, I just wanted to thank you both. And I, I think that was it for the questions, but I'll take one, one last second just to see if we have any last <laughs> any last minute stragglers. Um, Christine, just say again, thank you so much for participating in uh, this thank conversation. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so yeah. much. No, this is this is great. And um, you would never know that this is your first webinar. <laughs> I just shared your secret. <laughs> it's okay. I'll tell you a secret and then you can broadcast it to everybody. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, but, you know, um, I think I, it was very helpful to kind of break down the different uh, forms of art therapy, especially through this specific program that you guys are doing out in California. I think it's also helpful for people to understand that there are art therapists throughout the country because um, it actually was one of the first times that I had heard about it um, was when Michelle brought it up and that concept was not um, as familiar as, as just, you know, regular, I guess, regu like regular marriage counselor or um, a therapist or a psychologist or even somebody who works with um, animals. Um, I just did not think that there was such a thing as an art therapist. Um, so thank you for enlightening us with a little bit about what it is uh, that an art therapist does and, and can do for somebody living with chronic pain. Um, you received a lot of thank yous and that your program's excellent and that you, um, a lot of individuals actually said that you had them thinking about uh, ways that they can integrate art therapy either into their daily lives or into their support groups. So 
thank you so much um, uh, for participating. For yes, we appreciate you. it. And we will be sharing the link to the video. Uh, Christine will share it with me and then I'll send it out as an email to everybody else um, who joined us for this evening. And uh, just before we go, I wanted to remind everyone that we have two more November uh, events that are happening this month. Next week on November 12th, we have a Twitter chat. So we're switching it up a bit. Uh, where you just go on Twitter at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern time and use the hashtag art through pain. And we're just having a really informal conversation about how art has helped along your pain journey. Talk a little bit about your chronic pain experience and different uh, forms of art that you have found helpful. And then on November 20th, we have our th um, an author, um, Sonia, Sonia Huber, who is going to be talking a little bit about um, how she has utilized uh, her writing techniques and um, been able to kind of cope with her chronic pain and we'll be doing some writing prompts with you and a Q&A at the end, a very engaging conversation there as well. So we hope that you will go to our uspainfoundation.org backslash November website and register for any of those events. This webinar was recorded this evening. So if you wanted to uh, go back on any of the slides, please feel free to do that. We will have the recording up on our website as well. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I hope that you have a low pain rest of your days. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Take care. Bye.